Last week we heard Jesus telling parables about the celebration that occurs uh, and that accompanies finding lost sheep and a lost coin. You may remember that I made reference to the connection between those parables of lost things and their restoration and the most famous one that directly follows them in Luke's gospel, namely the parable of the prodigal son. Today, the parable of the dishonest or shrewd manager, this parable only occurs in Luke. And if you were listening, and I think you were, this is one of the most challenging parables to unpack. It serves as a thematic link between the graceful restoration of the lost in the parable of the prodigal son and what is to be a larger reflection on wealth, status, and eternity that we will have in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus next week. So, what's happening in today's parable? Jesus paints a scene of how working relationships and choices that are made in the economic sphere are related to matters of salvation. A rich man, perhaps even some of those who first heard the parable envisioned the forgiving father whose estate was split between his sons in the parable of the prodigal son. But even if it wasn't him, a rich man receives complaints that a manager is squandering his property. We don't know many important details that might help us to get a firmer grasp on this parable. Was the rich man a slave master relating to one of his high-ranking slaves? Or is the term master used more loosely by the manager to refer to his employer. Based on the size of the bills that are being considered, we can assume that the rich man is indeed very wealthy. A hundred jugs of olive oil and a hundred containers of wheat are not small debts, but actually considerable amounts that are owed. So the dishonest or shrewd, again, manager is told by the rich man that his management days are done, and he asks for a final accounting before dismissing him. The manager then summons his master's debtors, reduces the amount that they owe on their bills, and at the end gets commended by his boss for acting shrewdly. What is being commended exactly? Is it that the manager reduced the bills by the amount that he personally would have gotten as a fee, thereby leaving only that which was owed to the rich man, cutting out his part of the take? Is it that by reducing the bills from their original amount, the manager was able to keep these clients of the rich man from defaulting on their loan, thereby assuring that the master received something instead of nothing from them? Or is the commendable action that the manager, in seeing that he was about to be without a job and without a home, found a way to use this final accounting to make friends that would help secure his new future. There are so many questions surrounding this parable. Since Luke's gospel begins with Mary's Magnificat, and we talked about that uh, a couple of months ago, and Mary's Magnificat has these themes of social reversals, things like who is 
truly accounted rich and poor in God's kingdom. And since this same Gospel of Luke contains the story of Zacchaeus, the wealthy tax collector who only became truly rich once he restored the money that he had defrauded from his community. Because I think Luke is painting this much larger picture about how we are to relate to wealth and to relate to God and human beings. I believe that Jesus is telling this parable as a way of elevating social capital above the mere accumulation of financial wealth. It's not that money is evil. In fact, this manager today is praised because he employs money as a means of restoring right relationships. And coming on the heels of the prodigal son parable that has a wealthy man's estate at its very heart, it seems clear to me that it is not the mere presence, but rather our relationship to material goods and money that really matters. Do we serve the God of wealth and lay our entire life at the feet of the idol of mammon, aligning our decisions and our actions toward what will allow us to keep accumulating more and more? Or do we serve God and see all that we have including our gifts of money and resources, as tools in the restoration work that Jesus has inaugurated and has invited us to join. Jesus claims at the end of today's gospel that this choice about who we will serve, God or wealth, That choice is a binary one. We humans apparently cannot abide a divided loyalty regarding wealth. If we love and serve the idol of mammon, then there's no room for our love and service to God. But, I think this is really good news, if our allegiance is reversed, If we put our devotion to God first, then any material wealth that we have can be employed to further the mission of God and to restore communities and peoples who have been broken by the harsh wheel of unjust economics. Wealth can be an incredible tool but it is an unsatisfying, unrelenting, and dangerous master. How does the parable of the shrewd manager speak to our corporate life here at St. Paul's today? Those of you who have been on this journey with us for some time know that our viability as a church connected with the larger body of Christ throughout time and space, that viability is primarily located in how much our interpersonal relationships mirror the restoration that we have received in Jesus or don't. We have been blessed with many resources to carry out this work. Material resources that went into the building and the restoring of this sanctuary. That went into the construction of our organ and the provisions for our choir. Material resources that for almost 150 years have filled budgets that have enabled our ministries. And there is never a time 
that we don't need such resources to keep moving forward together. But if we are ever tempted to confuse these important tools of ministry with our ultimate goal, if we are ever tempted to fall under the delusion that they are ends in themselves instead of means for enabling us to pursue the true riches of which Jesus speaks today, then we should spend more time with today's parable. Let us reflect this week on the role that the pursuit of money and wealth play in our personal lives and find ways to use our personal and communal resources to heal broken relationships and reconnect with those whom the God of wealth has mercilessly broken. Perhaps if we do so, if we prove to be good managers and stewards of this essential reconciling work, then the Lord of life will begin to entrust to us the true riches for which our hearts, our church, and our entire world longs. True riches like unconditional love, like mercy and truth meeting and the reality of resurrection and grace. Riches that will never abandon us, like visions and experiences of the glory of God on earth as it is in heaven, and the peace which passes all understanding. Riches that arise from serving God and serving God alone.